you are listening to episode 193 of Mighty Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing Emma Skarakis for the second time. She is the co-founder of Saturi with Kitty Blomfield. They make really awesome collagen products, gelatin. They have a great beef liver product, uh, Cascara Sagrada. They actually just released a new collagen sourced from cod skins from a marine source. Really excited to try that. That's on the way from Australia. But this episode is about their new skincare line that they launched. They use some really unique ingredients, including niacinamide, caffeine, lanolin. And I really love their lip balm. As a guy, I'm sure I'm going to be using that a lot this winter. So the conversation goes way beyond, quote, poofa free skincare, which has become popular in the last couple years. I think what Kitty and Emma are doing with the Saturi skincare is way beyond what a lot of other companies are doing. So in this show, Emma shares her general philosophy about skin health, talk about acne, conditions like psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, her thoughts on cleansing, exfoliating, moisturizing. She talks about sun damage, photo damage, as it's called, urea, camphor, iron oxide, copper peptides, eugenol, uh, how to reverse pigmentation, and a lot more. So enjoy the show. Here is Emma Skarakis. Okay, Emma Skarakis, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's been a while. It has. Yeah, I think like a year or something. Uh, the last one we talked about uh, Saturi gelatin, collagen, cascara, all the cool products you guys have, you and Kitty. Um, but recently you guys launched a skincare line. That was like, um, what, four months ago or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Four months ago or so, but after, um, yeah, three years in the making, wow. it was pretty, yeah, long-winded, tiring process, really challenging, very, um, yeah, we had to learn as we went, but what we've come up with, we're, yeah, we're really happy with and we're starting to get reviews from people and some really good stories and testimonials, so such a relief because it's just you know, when you're working so hard on a certain product and you put it out there and you just hope people are going to like it and it's going to perform the way you hope it will. But, um, yeah, but just creating something that literally had none of the junk that we we wanted to avoid having in there was super challenging. And finding the right people to, to formulate with us. Um, yeah, we went through a few, but it's... A long time coming, but exciting to finally get it out. Yeah, yeah. what what is uh, what's some of the junk? Like, let's define uh, some of the things that like. Yeah. <laughs> well, first and foremost, it was after years with clients, and as you would probably all know, my business partner Kitty Blomfield. So she works with groups of women. I work with women one on one, and we both have done for years. Um, and something we would be educating our clients on in particular was being more discerning about the ingredients in all their foods they were eating, particularly more processed foods, and looking out for things like your industrial seed oils or your polyunsaturated fats and educating why they're perhaps not the best choice in your diet and how they can accumulate and being more aware of your old-fashioned saturated fats. So that's a big topic in all our conversations with clients. And then we noticed that you know, after they become educated on this particular topic, we get questions from clients saying, hmm, well, if I'm avoiding these particular fats in my foods and my cooking and when I go out, what about when I jump out of the shower and I, you know, coat myself in Nivea body lotion and I'm looking at the fats and it's all the fats you said of what in my diet, is this something that's also going to contribute to my fatty acid profile and perhaps should we be avoiding them on our skin? And we'd say, yes, definitely, um, particularly when you're warm and you've just come out of a shower and your skin's more prone to absorbing things, so absolutely. 
So then we get asked, what do you recommend in terms of products? And there was sort of a few products here and there, but nothing that we 100% felt particularly good about, apart from perhaps just slathering your body with coconut oil after a shower. But especially with kids, I don't know if you've tried it, but they get slippery and it, <laughs> it sort of resists absorption to a point. So, um, yeah, one day there was a conversation with Kitty offhand. She said, Emma, I've got to make some skincare products. Is nothing we can recommend and I said oh god oh, that sounds like hard work not something I'd ever anticipated getting myself into knowing full well that it's such a massive industry and you know there's a lot of competition and there's a lot just to, to put ourselves out there in that that circle as well and and perhaps uh, question the validity of so many of the products out there when you would sort of ruffle feathers so I said okay do you want help and she said well Yep, let's get on to it. And the very next day, Kitty being Kitty, she teed us up with a conversation with several formulators and we started the process. And, yeah, from there on, it was just trial and error, trial and error. Um, I did all the back-end research and the nitpicking of going through the ingredients I did and didn't want. Um, obviously, the first things first being none of your typical um, polyunsaturated oils. But this was a conversation that was interesting with formulators because they, to them, it's like, you know, if you've got organic almond oil, isn't that a good thing? And they weren't perhaps savvy on the differences of a polyunsaturated fat and a stable saturated fat and how they react differently to heat, light and oxygen and the stability or the instability of them. So, you know, I was obviously adamant that the fats had to be as saturated as possible, um, but also it's your, you know, your mineral oils, um, you know, the, um, the, well, the mineral oils are really interesting because they do accumulate in tissue and something we had to avoid. The types of preservatives, um, there's your typical chemicals that, of course, we're going to avoid, but being an industry standard product, we want something that we could manufacture. We do small batches, but still manufacture to a point that you can make enough of it. It's going to hold and it's going to keep and it's also not going to create mould in there because once you've got a fat oil emulsion, the mould is a real issue. So you still need to keep it safe and you still need to have preservatives, but not using your typical industry standard preservatives, which guarantee preservation, but they come with their own downside in terms of what they can do on the skin and how they accumulate. So we ended up really going back to some of what you might call very old-fashioned ingredients that were quite popular back in the 30s and 40s but have gone out of favour or don't have the same profit margin as your, your newer ingredients do. And at every point with the initial formulators, they're like, why would you want to use that? Or we just can't get that. Or this is just not going to work. Or this won't emulsify that and this won't hold. Um, they were very no, no, no at every point. And we were getting there but the resistance to really innovate was just a struggle. So we dumped them, found new formulators, and finally we found a team who said, we want to do something different with you. We want to innovate. And, yeah, that sounds difficult and tricky and not the easy way of doing things, but we're willing to give it a try. So that was exciting. So I just stayed stubborn on, on what I really did want this to, you know, be made up of. And, yeah, so we've sort of come up with something that is things crossed, touch wood. It's all staying together. Um, it's doing what we'd hope it would do, but... Yeah, it's 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 been interesting and real really interesting to see that when you delve into all these ingredients and the ones that seem insignificant and well, it's just an emulsify. How bad can that be? You look you look at the potential downsides of these ingredients and how much is in these skincare products, um, and even your standard you know organic products. A lot of the Australian brands there there's some really horrendous stuff in them. Um, the stuff in particular sold that's kid-friendly or recommended for babies is really quite horrific and troubling. And I think they still see the skin as this impermeable barrier that just rubs stuff on it, it's going to fall off again. But, you know, a percentage of this will make it to your bloodstream and we've got to be cautious of what we're rubbing on our largest organ. So, yeah, the body cream in particular, I wanted that to be completely family-friendly and 
you know, safe for anyone to use and the kids, um, all products really, you know, the lip balm, obviously you're going to ingest some of it. Um, and the face cream too, we wanted something to hold together but still have some really exciting actives in there. Um, and, yeah, well, what are your thoughts on it, Matt? If you had a go, are you feeling? <laughs> <I'm very nice. laughs> I, I, I love it. Um, yeah, I, the lip balm, you know, as a man, I think is my my favorite. And it's just super thick. Like um, I like like tallow lip balm works really well, um, but this just feels like more more substantial. So it's my new my new favorite lip balm, and the face cream is awesome too. Um, after I get out of the shower, I've been enjoying that. Um, like I'm not too prone to dry skin, um, but I think you know I was like vegan vegetarian for like ten years, and I think that did a number on me, not getting any fat soluble vitamins or protein <laughs> or so many nutrients. Um, so I think my skin took the hit. And so, um, I can still see, you know, some scarring and stuff like that, that I'm curious if, uh, you know, I have the internal stuff down systemic enzymes and the right foods mm. and animal foods and stuff, um, carbs, but yeah, I'm hoping doing the external funny story. Actually, I remember being a teenager and, uh, I was suffering from pretty bad acne, like didn't cover my whole face, but it was like, every week there was like a new pimple that showed up on my face that was really embarrassing. And one day I saw this commercial for uh, proactive, which is like a really popular brand, mm -hmm. at least here in the States. I don't know if it's over there. And it's like, it was like a huge infomercial on some channel. It's like, this is going to cure your acne. And I got so excited and it was like huge investment at the time. For me. <laughs> and I got it and it did nothing. And uh, I mean, the ingredients are probably, horrendous you know not only you know tons of poofas but so many other things so um yeah this topic of skincare is pretty pretty important uh because i think i really the the most important thing is like internal nutrition right but if you combine that with the proper skincare you could see huge results like like miracles <laughs> oh 100 percent, and yeah you hit the nail on the head because skincare should be seen as what you put on the inside as more so than what you put on the outside, honestly. You know, I think even on topics like acne, well, any kind of skin condition where the skin's really unhappy, I prefer to see it as more, more often than not that it's not an issue of the skin per se. Your skin is like that end point of the pathways going, you know, started deep down somewhere else. And your skin's just bearing the brunt of that deficiency or that inflammation or that irritation. And until that's addressed, anything topical that might help that, it's only going to be that Band-Aid. It's still, you know, wh whatever's um, going wrong on the inside is still going to be an issue. So it's absolutely both completely. Um, acne is an interesting one. You know, we get the questions, is your cream going to kill my acne? And I was like, oh, acne comes from a, a long line of issues and you know and, and and different different causes too but yeah it could help calm it at the skin surface but you've really got to address what's going on internally and in a weird kind of way see those issues or whether it's acne psoriasis eczema um rosacea almost see those outward signs as your body communicating that kind of like see it as a gift that your body's saying there's something going on down here that we need to address and look, it's showing up here. It's talking to you, telling you to address this issue or, I don't know, look at your bloods, work with someone and just reassess your diet, your whole entire lifestyle. Um, but not just to see it as this inconvenience that, yeah, I've got to have some kind of treatment or some outward thing I've got to slather on. You're not deficient in skincare products. You're deficient in something else. So, it's got to be both, and that's why it was important to us that when we're doing topical skincare products, we're also educating and providing products that are going to hopefully address something internally, you know, which is why we're big on the liver and the collagens and gelatin, um, among other things. But, it's yeah, it's absolutely both, and hopefully people start to see that. And, and it's a strange thing. Here I am, you know, we're selling skincare range, but... I really do encourage people to 
you know, you can't rely on that alone. You, you do want to see everything. And, and definitely less is more topically, I think, too. And our stuff is designed in a way that it doesn't have the level of fillers that most products have. It has got high concentrations of the ingredients we put in there. Um, you shouldn't need much at all. And you also, you don't want to be slathering your skin with so much stuff because you can actually inhibit your body's own response, you know, at the skin level to generate its own moisture levels and do its own thing. Um, it, unless you're wearing a hell of a lot of makeup or you've got particularly excessively oily skin, you know, perhaps only cleansing once a day is more than enough. Some days, particularly for blokes, when, you know, you're not putting on the layers of stuff that girls might be. Uh, you, if you don't feel that there's excess junk on your skin, don't clean it or splash it with some water, but don't over cleanse. Definitely don't over exfoliate. Don't even necessarily over moisturize. It's just fill the gaps when you can see that, oh, maybe the conditions outside are that much drier and more stripping and my skin's a bit compromised and it needs some help and it supports it. But ultimately when your skin is truly healthy and you've nourished it from the inside, your skin should ultimately moisturise itself, exfoliate itself, you know, move debris along itself. Um, so, yeah, it's it's we wanted to see this as, and I'm like, you know, we've got a bit of a slogan, seriously saturated skin support, and I want it to be skin support as opposed to skin care. Like it's really undermining the skin's innate intelligence if you just go, oh, your skin needs a moisturiser. Your skin needs to be exfoliated. Your skin needs to be lasered. It's almost like saying your skin is quite pathetic and was designed to be a bit, you know, um, it can't do its own thing. It can do its own thing if you give it the room. And on top of that, the additional ingredients we put in are things that only support your skin to do it itself better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. One thing. Um, I thought about years ago was um, like lip moisturizers and I, I went to a, a health lecture and the speaker said that if you have chapped lips uh, it means you're dehydrated. He was kind of coming from like a liquidarian perspective. And uh, I always thought that was interesting. Um, probably maybe a more accurate way to say it is, you know, potassium sodium imbalance or electrolyte imbalance or your, your skin can't hold on to moisture, but I noticed that's a tough one. I mean, when I'm doing so many things right, I still get dry lips, whether it's in the middle of winter or whatever. Um, so I think there's, there's always like spaces to support our body in those like dips. Oh, right? <laughs> well, you look in history and things like lanolin, which is the main component of our lip balm, you know, back in ancient Egyptian days, you know, they say, Cleopatra used it for her, you know, give her that extra glow. But absolutely, substances have been used to help support the skin. And there are extreme conditions that are always going to compromise your skin, no matter how, no matter how healthy you are. Absolutely. That's interesting about Cleopatra. So I'm, I'm like, more, more and more, I'm living her lifestyle because I bathe in my goat milk. Oh, uh, so which, she, what she did, suppose <laughs> <did> milk baths. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Maybe that's, that's, that could be your new tagline, the Cleopatra <laughs> diet master. <laughs> this, and then the other thing too, it's with all these things, people are always looking for what's that one supplement that could fix my skin or that product or, the, you know, whether it be skin or another health condition. But even maybe even more important than that is just getting fresh air, natural light, um, sleep. I mean, if anyone knows they can have the best skincare routine, the best diet, but if they're up till all hours and not sleeping well, you look haggard and old in the morning. I mean, it's 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 got to be everything, and it's got to everyone's got to take on that responsibility, I guess, at looking at their whole lifestyle. You know, their stress, their, their job, like it, it it all it's all a factor. Stress is paramount, really. So all these things are add on. So long as you have your foundations right. They can do wonders, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the gummies, um, using your gelatin from Saturi has become a staple. And I think that's a, a huge skin support thing, just the, the proline and glycine in there. 
And um, my girlfriend actually got me to start using honey, like at the ends, so you add raw honey instead of white sugar, which, you know, you can, yeah. or you could do both, but uh, it definitely okay. is like lighter with the honey. I, I've been really liking that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And any kind of, whether it's gelatinous broths, gelatin collagen, um, it literally increases the moisture level in the skin. So mm. again, do we, do we, moisturize from the outside only or do we you know bring it in from inside and then the additional stuff can just help protect us from the elements and and also from protect us from pollutants and when we're living in the big cities you know the, the other things that can really wreak havoc at the skin levels so yeah but definitely gelatin in every way I'm a big fan of that and it's not something that we should even see as you know this this new supplement that all of a sudden it's buzzword and we've all got to take our gelatin product. It would have been the case, you know, our great, great grandmothers would have naturally been cooking really gelatinous meals and they were always just using whole cuts and slow cooking things that extract that gelatinous goodness out of, you know, the cartilage and the joints that they were cooking. You know, I've got some of my favourite cookbooks. I've got some up here. Um, Looking through the recipes, they, they would never waste the drippings and the juices. They would reduce those down. They became the sauces. You didn't see them just cooking a lean piece of steak and that was it. It always had all those components to it. They even did those, um, you know, jellies of every form, savoury and sweet. Uh, the gelatin was used to thicken in the custards. Like it was just throughout all their meals. So where eating differently now and it's more convenience based, I guess. But if at the same time, if you're not going to go back to cooking those ways, at least throwing some gelatin there or some gummy bears and things like that. It's yeah, really helpful. Yeah. I, I tend to crave bone broth more in the, in the winter when it's cold and I'm very yeah. fortunate to have, I have friends up here that own a company and they make pastured chicken broth with, you know, spices and it's delicious. And, um, there were sometimes last winter I was consuming, I think it was like 50, 50 plus ounces a day. Uh, Cause I'd just be sipping on it all day and put it on my yeah. wood stove, go out and plow snow, come back, take a sip. You know, <laughs> I want your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was curious, Emma, did you guys ever think of using zinc or did that come up in your research? Cause I've been looking into that mineral specifically recently. And um, you know, the health community, natural health community talks about it all the time, you know, 300 plus enzymes, whatever, depend on it. But I know they use zinc oxide and sunscreen, right? But I was wondering if it had any use in um, yeah. regular skin it, it was definitely one we looked into and it was in some of our trials. Um, the thing is, a lot of your cosmetic grade zinc tends to be zinc oxide, exactly. And it does have that slightly whitening, mattifying sort of effect. So it, it really came down to you know, it perhaps took away from just that that neutral moisturization. And if we do going forward do other products, we are formulating makeup and some other things going forward. It, it could definitely be a major factor in that. So it could be another way to get, yeah, that mineral in on the skin. But yeah, it can sort of cake up, you know, the um the actual formulation a little bit. But yeah, we're constantly looking at what else we could bring into the line um yeah make up something we started on because i think oh you might have said you had a question about it but um yeah iron oxide in makeup it's the main ingredient to give that that bronzy you know brownish sort of tint to things and it's not something we want to apply to the skin so we found another way of doing it but yeah playing with colors that's that's tricky too so it might take us a while yeah. Yeah. You don't want to go outside looking like a ghost if it's uh winter. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. And it's, I mean, you don't want to make it purely an aesthetic thing, but that's important to people too. It might turn mm -hmm. off some people. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to ask too, like um, circling back to the polyunsaturated fats, um, a couple of your products you say to keep in the fridge. Um, was it the, the body cream, I think, and the, one of, one yeah, of the other ones. ice cream. Look, it's not it's not a must. It was mm. recommended as a kind of as probably for 
a formulator recommended as a statement going forward just because, again, we're not using your common industry standard preservatives mm -hmm. and although the preserve preservatives that we're using um, have got great historical significance and they're really proven, because they're not, they don't have that tick like your more conventional stuff that's widely used, we have to do extra things to, you know, make it look safe to on sellers and things like that. Um, first thing we did was make sure that the face cream, particularly that's in an airless pump, so, you know, less oxidation or um, potential oxidation, which is one thing. And also to, if we don't have that control, just say someone in the middle of summer in Texas buys our product and it's being shipped from Australia, perhaps it got stuck on a dock somewhere and it's sitting there in heat. Um, yeah, it's, or, yeah, or sitting in a warm climate on someone's bathroom bench in full sun you know, putting those kind of statements is more just to allude to keep it at least out of sun, keep it in cool places. But, yeah, more often than not we're finding it's not needing that. Um, but at the same time, just be cautious of not keeping these things in, in the warmth, which you shouldn't do with any products anyway, really. But, yeah, so far we're not having any issue with um, shelf life. It's, you know, it's early days. But, again, not making them in oversized containers so sort of use things up and go through them quickly, um, keep it fresh, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. But when you buy, you shouldn't need to be in the fridge, yeah. Yeah, I'll keep it in the coolest part of the house because I was keeping them in the fridge, but I only kind of cook the house with my wood stove in the middle of winter and sometimes you know, I yeah. need to open no, up all the windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be so totally fine. Oh, mine's been sitting out the whole time. I never kept mine in the fridge and we're, we were coming out of winter in Australia, but even still yeah the weather fluctuates and we're getting reports we're getting a lot of customers in the states and yeah so far everything's holding holding well <laughs> i'm loving it yeah it's it's cool stuff the the oil cleanser i wanted to ask you about um so is that like you were saying don't use it if you don't feel the need to um and that's is that like the main thing to know <laughs> with that one? i think so. oh, look you could you could use it twice a day but I think there's also something to the the substances that your skin generates and manufactures at the skin level through the night too when you're resting um we we, ge we generate our own natural moisturizing factors and there's you know really cool stuff your skin is creating so if you wake up in the morning and maybe you just feel a accumulation of slight oiliness you know in your t-zone Perhaps just maybe splash, you know, your face with a little water and, and push that stuff around. See how your skin goes with that. You might not need to actually strip that stuff off. I mean, that's your skin does make good stuff. It's it's designed pretty well. Um, and maybe to encourage more of that as opposed to just continuously, you know, like sloughing everything off the skin level and maybe that tells your skin to make too much oil because you're constantly pulling it away so i mean play with it but really get in tune with with your skin and and don't just go by a schedule you know don't just go you know cleanse twice a day moisturize twice a day like it's i don't know i think it's like with everything with food and everything don't just follow a diet just stop and go am i actually hungry you know or, what am i craving maybe my body's telling me something but to stop and actually respect what your skin can make too is pretty awesome. Um, so, again, everyone's different. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to this either, but you may only need to kind of clean it as such in the evening. And we prefer the oil cleansing method as opposed to a detergent-based cleanser, which pulls everything away. Um, your skin should feel clean, but it shouldn't feel stripped and you know thirsty and yeah we're, we're getting good response with this too from people who've never really done oil cleansing before or didn't like the idea of it and were scared to they thought it might make the skin feel oilier but yeah if you do it correctly it's yeah it, it, it seems to be a gentle way of yeah of cleaning without stripping completely mm -hmm. that's a really good point about the skin making everything we need and maybe like i think we all have nights where we're underslept and we wake up just not feeling 100%. I know when that happens to me, um, you know, just that extra support 
you know, not only a nap, but just, you know, taking other, you know, specific supplements, maybe higher doses, and then probably the skincare. Uh, So my skin doesn't feel the greatest when I wake up and I didn't get a full night's rest. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And, and also to um, just, yeah, there's really something to like touch in the skin and just getting in touch with it, like not just to take your moisturizer, dab it on, run it, run away, sort of stop when you're cleansing to just really moist, you know, sort of massage that stuff in and consider how you push it around your face, you know, like pushing things up and back and really releasing any tension, you know, enjoy the feeling of the warm washcloth. And, and then when you apply moisturizer too, which you shouldn't need very much, I don't even like to call it a moisturizer because that's like saying the skin doesn't moisturize. It's a face cream, which supports your own natural moisturizing factors but to yes yeah, stop and give yourself a bit of a facial massage at the same time might only be 20 seconds but rather than just dabbing that stuff all over you know consider what tension you can release and help that stuff move in and slow down take a breath um make a little ritual out of it but you know everything's so rushed but stop and enjoy that and i've even seen with some people they've noted the benefits of how they apply the stuff I was talking to a client recently who noticed too now that she's she's using me she's slowing down she's using much much less product she's not no longer doing her seven step skincare routine she used to do but she's taking time to apply it and she's playing with different techniques of how you could do kind of facial massage and just you know use your knuckles and use your palms um you can use gua sha tools and things but you can just just use your hands but just bringing that even that circulation back to the face as well and moving, you know, built up fluid and puffiness. And I think it's, I think it's a really important part of it. Yeah. There have been times where I got massages and they're massaging like my head, my sinuses, my face, and my sinuses just drain like Niagara Falls. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you sort of forget how much tension we, you know, go for the back, neck, shoulder massage, but how much tension can be in the face and in the scalp and, yeah, it, it's huge. It can be such a relaxing thing and just a grounding thing. A good way to start your day and end your day, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Emma, should we jump into some of these questions? Because we have, uh, sure. have a bunch here. Um, let's see. Um, this is one I'm really curious about, like the the copper peptides. So why copper, mm-hmm. copper peptides and um, I've used other skincare products that have it in it and just copper by itself, like copper or GHK. But mm-hmm. that one from Washington had a lot of other crappy ingredients, like really long names I couldn't pr- pronounce. And so I haven't stayed yeah. consistent with Sorry, that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this seemed to be, again, as far as sort of cosmetic grade, uh, you know, substances went, it's the copper tripeptide one, I think that seems to get the most benefits. But with this one, it was the Natural Library of Medicine, I think, that um, wrote an article and the list of benefits when copper is applied locally to skin cells was pretty awesome. I can read you, I can read you a few of them, but yeah, tightening loose skin, reversing thinned, thinning of aged skin, repair protective skin barrier proteins, improve skin firmness, elasticity, clarity, fine lines, wrinkles. I mean, these are all things that were, found to be benefits with regular use, uh, re- reducing the photo damage, hyperpigmentation, skin spots, lesions, improved overall skin appearance, stimulates wound healing, protects skin from UV radiation, like pretty, you know, pretty profound list. And it was something that, you know, with a knowledge of making sure copper is there for the skin cells as well, it's, you know, it's so depleted in our foods these days um, and the issues with excess iron and depleted copper that we knew that was something that we definitely wanted to get in there. Um, It was one of the more expensive ingredients, absolutely. And again, we were discouraged from using it because it would not allow for higher profits and all of this. It's really interesting. Um, Yeah, we were adamant. We had to, we had to get in there and we got it in, you know, in decent amounts as well. Yeah, and it, it, I think that mineral itself 
and, and it's not more important than zinc. That's something I've kind of uh, came out about <laughs> the last couple of months because there's some people who say copper is more important than iron or copper is more important than zinc. And no, mm-hmm. nutrient is more important than any other, obviously. But um, I like that you have vitamin E in there too. And so that's at least two antioxidants. You probably have more. I think caffeine is technically one, right? Cholesterol. Yeah, and then, yeah, and I think the um, neuroginin. In, it works in that way as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. The the photo damage that you said is fascinating because um, I noticed in the health community, there's like the more is better and it's it's a really seductive mentality and people, you know, unlimited sunbathing kind of message. Um, and I I think that is is a recipe for, for photo damage because um, the sun is, it's not bad. It's just, it's a stressor. And overdo, it's like overdoing the sauna or we're doing the ice bath. Like I think people can cause harm um, even if they have a perfect diet and perfect supplements and skincare routine with overdoing this stressor called, you know, ultraviolet light. Um, so yeah, the photo damage is oh, really anything. interesting. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's like anything, isn't it? Too much of a good thing. Absolutely. But, and, and also being responsible and reasonable with your your sun exposure and going out in small increments to start with if you haven't been exposed to sun in a long time and going to the point of perhaps getting that little tingle when, you know, maybe vitamin D is being triggered, which is a good thing, but not going beyond that and never going out to that point of burning, which for everyone is different. Um, and I think it really depends on a person's poof accumulation, their perhaps lack of vitamin E, if they're more estrogen dominant, um, you know, whatever you want to, um, that, that's, it's the balance of things. If there's too much accumulated iron perhaps and lacking copper, we're all going to respond to the UV rays differently. And maybe if you've addressed all those things, you've got this ideal balance of those elements in your system, you could probably go all day in the sun and not, you know, and not burn, but everyone's different. And I think your cultural background is a big one too, you know, Mm -hmm the amount of pigment in your skin, absolutely. But I think when um, having some of these kind of substances like applied to your skin, particularly more saturated fats and vitamin E and, um, you know, perhaps the copper, perhaps neuroginin, some of these things have that, you can't call it a sunscreen as such, but they have these UV protective elements that make you more able to tolerate the sun and perhaps not, you know, burn as readily or, or have the effects of the oxidative stress show up on the skin, you know, mm-hmm. quite as badly. Yeah. Yeah. I know copper is required to make melanin. So it's probably a pretty cool sunscreen in itself. Um, but when you stack all these things together, that's really cool. Um, yeah. Recently I had my friend, Dr. Tyler on the show, Pansner, and he, um, he posted a photo of himself middle of the summer. He was fully tan, shirtless. He said low vitamin D. And turns out his genetics, he, he had a mutation. Um, it was a homozygous mutation, which is a big deal for this gene to synthesize D3 from sunlight. He basically couldn't do it. So even wow. in the summer, he had to supplement D3 to get through yeah. it. And uh, recently, I've been looking into how D3 itself is a sunscreen, like when your levels are good, um, which is fascinating because people think like, like you could do it in reverse like you don't need to get it from the sun if you can't for whatever reason office worker or genetics um so you could actually take it to have the sunscreen effect just kind of interesting but yeah right exactly this is it and it's again it it has to be it has to come down to the individual individual and yeah their their general health and their background and their ability to what the body can and can't create so yeah there's no there's no blanket can make any of these ingredients really but as long as they're things that have potential benefits without the potential downside which is what is generally loaded in so many skincare products i mean you see what's in sunscreens as such i don't know about where you live but you know in most of australia in the summer it's 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 a big thing it's really pushed to you know like slather yourself and protect yourself from the sun because the sun's going to kill you and they've really come hard on that message it's crazy you you see people they get to the beach and the minute they 
uncover their child, they're just slathering them head to toe in white junk. And it's just so concerning. Like they're not going to get the benefits of the sun either. And I've seen those products. You know, there was a there was a study on sunscreen in particular that within 20, 30 minutes of applying it to the skin, what showed up in the blood, you know, in terms of the ingredients such so titanium dioxide and things like this, is um, yeah, it's pretty scary. And that whole conversation that perhaps the sunscreens are really uh, increasing the sun, skin cancer risk. So, I mean, that's a whole other conversation in itself. But yeah, you, you want substances that could help you gain the benefits of the sun without, you know, and lessen the downside, but not block it entirely necessarily. And if you had too much, put on a hat and go into a tree, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of a hat if, if you can't avoid it and you need to be out, you know. Mm. For a, on a really long hike or whatever it is. I'll never forget, my brother took me to a Metallica concert. You were speaking of like the <laughs> upside down world with, with sunscreen, people going out and covering up. And uh, the, you know, the intro band played and then the sun was setting and the guy was wearing these really dark sunglasses. So he was wearing those during the day. And then as soon as the sun set, he took them off and the Metallica lights come on. I'm like, this guy has it completely reversed. He should have been putting you know, blue yeah. blockers on when the concert <laughs> yeah. started and not wearing the sunglasses. Sure. I mean, there's, there's a time for sunglasses and it's all context, <laughs> but like, I think <laughs> most people doing these behaviors aren't aware of what they're doing and that's the big problem. So. No, it's just a shame when things like sunshine is seen as scary and dangerous. It's like, well, how did we get here? <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, it's concerning. But then maybe if people weren't eating the kind of foods they've been eating, their body wouldn't respond quite so badly to the sun anyway. But look at the modern diet and it's setting you up to to burn with sun exposure. Right. Yeah. I haven't gone to, you know, festivals in years and I think I'm done with those. But I remember years ago going to these, you know, art and speaker, health speakers and stuff. And all the food, all the food booths, like say 99% of them were fried food, fried uh, polyunsaturated fats. And people are going and eating that and then going out all day and cooking in the sun yeah. like a lobster. And that's like the worst yeah. combination. Drinking alcohol and stuff for that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's troubling. So I, I, and I, and I think too, it's interesting that, you know, you put it out there in the, you know, the world of skincare, which is, so enormous and so saturated with you know some good stuff but a lot of a lot of rubbish that's just all marketing and you look at how people sell these products and it's it comes with all its claims and promises that it will be anti-aging and it will um reverse all your signs of it all that sort of thing but it's it's so wrong because if there's no consideration about what's going in the body um you can't make those claims you know it's, it's it's got to be work from both ends and, you know, and you've also got to consider how long have you been eating those sort of foods or, you know, living that stressful lifestyle, um, how long might it take for these things to, to help you a little bit. But, it de yeah, it definitely needs to be both. Yeah. Do you have a lot of customers that combine uh, red light therapy with your your skin? Yeah, skin absolutely. Light? Yeah, definitely a big proponent of that. And I think a lot of these things, you know, work even better with with that in mind absolutely so um yeah red light even even a small amount of day can help buffer all the blue we're exposed to i guess or you know like you said block out the i, I think it's when people don't realize too that just their internal lighting in their home is, mm -hmm. is potentially you know more so the blue spectrum and how much of that they're getting all day long but yeah absolutely some red light exposure yeah, some of the face masks are so creepy. Like someday I want to answer my oh, door no. where I go. Do you have one to you? I think my kids would not tolerate that. My son would freak out. Would not Even just um, yeah, just a general good red light device mm -hmm. that generally gives that that correct spectrum. Uh, yeah, it's almost sold these days that you have to go into a beauty clinic and you have to have it for treatment from their devices and pay a hundred dollars a pop. You don't have to do that. You can just get 
stand in red light or if you can wear the creepy mask, sure, but um, <laughs> yeah. just use mine as a light and read to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. How is this comparable to tallow face cream? Someone asked. Yeah, uh, oh, tallow is a, a good old-fashioned fat too, absolutely better than so much of the um, unsaturated oils out there. I think, though, with us, we we really wanted to come at this with a, as saturated as we could get. Um, we, we, I don't think people these days have a, could potentially have a deficiency of poofers or monounsaturated fats. So even the tallow, really depending on the source, it can still have a bit too much poofer. But um, more often than not with tallow, it's as monounsaturated as it is polyunsaturated, if not more monounsaturated which is fine too. It's more, it's more stable than a polyunsaturated fat, absolutely. But we just wanted to get as stable and as solid as we could get with the, with the fat component of our product. Um, and it just gave us more ability to bring in other ingredients as well when we're using just more of these, um, you know, uh, coconut-derived fats. And, yeah, it's just... We, we had more room to play with it as well. But, yeah, there was still that monounsaturated element which lacked the stability we were looking for and we just wanted to go, obviously, with the name saturated, French for saturated, and that was the whole premise of what we wanted to do. So it didn't really fit with what we were trying to achieve. Oh, I always wondered that. I didn't know about the name saturated. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that either of us are French, but it's interesting over the years, even when you talk diets with people, a lot of the things you start recommending and the, the common, I suppose, the, the things that tie together so many of the, you know, the applications around food, it's like the French really had it had it sorted and what they still do today and how they eat. You know, they don't go overboard with portions. They, you know, they use butter for everything. They use old-fashioned meats. They use offal. Um, they don't shy away from some of the things that more modern diets do, and it's really respected and done so beautifully, and um, it's made delicious. And the French thing seems to have kept coming up. And then, yeah, I think it was even a client who, when we were trying to brainstorm names and we were looking at saturated, that's why we're doing this to start with. It's what you know got us started with wanting to do skincare a different way. And she thought, what about saturate? And I thought, mm, that sounded a bit wanky, being a bit Frenchy. <laughs> but then another client who's actually French said to me, it's interesting in terms of like street language in, in France, they, they use the word saturate to denote being like fed up with something. And we thought, well, that kind of fits with it too. We're kind of fed up with not finding enough stuff that we could buy for ourselves and our you know, recommended clients. So we did it ourselves. So anyway, it's, Yeah things to tickle the boxes i love it that's super cool that's kind of my goal with my life and i'm yeah working on some cool stuff but <laughs> um yeah. yeah i think you guys are doing awesome stuff i really i really love it and um oh, thanks. we appreciate you yeah I, I i wanted to say i pulled up i i don't know if i'll have time to list all the ingredients but that proactive i mean i think they're a huge company i don't think they'll listen to this podcast <laughs> we can we can bash them but <laughs> <laughs> but the active ingredient is like benzoyl peroxide like two and a half percent but then you go to the inactive ingredients and if i had to guess there's literally 30 things and the second ingredient is magnesium aluminum silicate um yes. and you have like peg 100 sorbitol yeah. Uh, another peg 12 <laughs> it's like paraffin uh peg another peg 12 it's just propylene right. glycol it's insane yeah. like it's horrendous and they're putting on teenage kids you know it's, oh, <laughs> it's oh, yeah, yeah it's 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 really it's really concerning isn't it yeah they do have urea in there that was one i was curious about because one oh, yeah. um uh, my first apartment, I had a urine therapy guy that was on National Geographic stayed our apartment, and it was it was horrible. You peed in my mason jars and aged them over the <laughs> fireplace. <laughs> God. <laughs> but this is a chemical, right? It's not extracted from. Yeah. Like... No, no, no. Don't. We're not being human urine or anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying on the website that it's synthetically created, absolutely. Mm. But yeah, it's um. 
like nat- it's a naturally occurring factor in part of your natural moisturising factors in the skin that when you're young you generate enough of and it correlates with having younger skin and it definitely does decrease with age. But, yeah, it has natural, you know, uh, subtle exfoliating factors as well. It's part of what helps your skin sort of exfoliate itself and move skin cells along. Hmm. Um yeah, but it's also got a slight antibacterial sort of and uh, preservative effects as well, which helps support our product. But mm. yeah, it's something that again, you know, younger skin naturally has these things. So for someone with older skin who's done to lack these substances, it's like, oh, why not bring them to the skin? And that was a big reason why I was adamant we had to source um, cholesterol as a major ingredient. And if you saw that, it's right at the top of our ingredients, but that in itself was yeah i was adamant about getting that and the first few formulators said it's just not possible you know the amounts you have to order are too enormous it's too expensive you've got to get in from france and it was just no 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 across the board until we found someone who was willing to get it and we found it um but again this is not derived from any you know um animal substance part it's just from lanolin so it's extracted from the lanolin concentrated but when it comes to um, cholesterol naturally occurring in the skin, the older the skin is, the you know, cholesterol levels in the cell actually drop substantially and they found the older and more wrinkled the skin looks, the less cholesterol is in the cells. So it's one of the most uh, reliable biomarkers of assessing how aged the skin is, um, the cholesterol, like sort of in the dermis. So they found that, Again, you know, some substances you apply topically locally to the skin and it doesn't necessarily have the effect of mimicking that if the body was making it, but applying cholesterol locally does have that effect. So, yeah, we were really keen to get that in. But it doesn't Mm. sound as attractive as some of the, you know, the punchy little products that are out there that are selling substances now, you know, selling skincare products and getting people um, to want to buy the products. We're pushing you know, cholesterol is being anti-aging and wonderful because it's got negative connotation. But, yeah, it was really cool to learn about how bringing cholesterol back towards the skin cells really has that effect to regenerate skin cells again. That's really cool. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up um, lanolin because that's the first ingredient in lip balm, uh, the lip balm mm-hmm. product. And it, isn't that what they get vitamin D3 from a lot of the time for supplements? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in itself, it will contain some of it, but it also allows your skin to be better able at manufacturing it, definitely. Oh, that's cool. Wow. Yeah, but the land is from, um, yeah, Australian wool. And some people still, since the, I was around the 70s, Lanolin got a really bad rap because they started using a lot more chemicals on the sheep um so there were so many you know to clean the sheep or dip the wool before using it for industry so then when they took lanolin from the you know it's the wool fat basically um there were still remnants of these chemicals so then people reacted badly to the lanolin but it wasn't lanolin's fault it was the chemicals so since then they've really cleaned up that industry and now lanolin is so purified that any negative responses people used to have to lanolin um, just aren't occurring more often than not because the chemical issue was taken away. So it's really, yeah, cleaned up that ingredient. But, yeah, it's an awesome ingredient. It just it creates a breathable barrier, um, which makes it excellent as a lip balm. And, and our lip balm has been found with getting really interesting stories from people who are using it on, you know, dry patches anywhere on the body, you know, creating a barrier when the skin's own natural barrier functions are somewhat impaired to help kind of supplement that barrier, I guess, until the skin heals. People with really, you know, recurring eczema and things like that, and it's really helping in clearing that up as well. Um, So it's, yeah, it's a good universal product just for those, you know, braises and skin conditions and things like that and and on kids if they get, you know, eczema patches and things. So it's worth, um, yeah, if you shied away from Lalan for those reasons, it's worth coming back to it and, giving it a try because it's yeah it's it's better than what it used to be during those those years wow i'll have to order some more because um you know i'm not intensive farming but just 
outside working with the animals and stuff, I get scuffed up, especially in the winter. You know, I'll just graze my hand or my arm on something, and get a little scrape. Um, or, or sometimes my cats will scratch me with their claws. <laughs> so you're saying I could apply that to little scratches and, and scrapes? Yeah, and... look, I think if it's not fully broken and bleeding, mm -hmm. you know, bandage that. But yeah, you know, abrasions and things like that, absolutely give it a try. Um, but you might want to get yourself some sheep, Matt. Like if you shear <laughs> sheep, they, they, they found that, you know, the, the men who were constantly shearing sheep, they had these beautiful young-looking hands you know the skin wow. on their hands was so beautiful because they were obviously dealing with the sheep wool all day long so they were yeah they were experiencing the benefits of lanolin on their hands all day wow. and they're renowned for such beautiful youthful looking hands so maybe instead of buying a farm you could just <laughs> fusion sheep <laughs> that's really that's really cool i don't know it's really yeah. a thing there is it sheep in your I think so. Yeah, there's there's more elk farms. Um, yeah, more elk and uh, goats, I think, and and cows up here. I haven't seen too many sheep. Oh, I think some llama or alpaca farms. Um, it's it's cool. I interviewed um, a guy that started a a company for bedding. Um, so like Swiss, uh, I think I think German made Swiss beds. Um, like an old company, but they use virgin sheep's wool. And he was describing how sheep's wool is self-cleaning. And most uh, companies uh, just buy the treated stuff. And so you have to like wash it frequently. And it's a d whole different type of care than if it's a virgin sheep wool. Literally every night, like if you sweat, he was saying, it just, or even your child pees <laughs> in the bed, it'll just absorb it and then clean it, which like mm -hmm. blew my mind. Like you just have to put it out in the sun and then like spray it with water and let it dry and it'll just fully regenerate a couple times a year it's wild like the sheep are incredible animals absolutely i, I think it's it's probably a bigger thing here in australia we have a, a lot of sheep and mm. lamb is a very big part of it I'm, I'm half greek so we do a lot of lamb <laughs> i don't know it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be with my american clients and nutrition i you know, it's something I sort of might recommend and and that it doesn't seem as accessible. It's not as big a thing, You're probably more into beef and <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I haven't seen too many lamb up here. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta get good lamb and cook a great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um benefits the ingredient eugenol. Um I forget what what plant that's from. Sounds is it um yeah, it's from mainly clove, sometimes cinnamon. Um, yeah, it's got incredible antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, um, even subtle antioxidant properties. So we brought it in in particular when they were suggesting the types of preservatives we'd use and there was nothing that didn't come with a potential negative or another, like you, you look into these preservative ingredients and they're never just a one single ingredient. They're like a little compound where they've, group together a few substances and they always come with something that's a bit sus which I didn't like the look of um and actually Dr Pete suggested to me look into eugenol I hadn't heard of it myself and so I went back to the formula and said can you access this and they said this stuff you know we haven't used this in years and it's just again it was seen as quite an old-fashioned substance but again it was used as a preservative and it also has these other benefits which apply to the skin actually improves skin function as well, um, particularly the, the antimicrobial properties too. So anyway, we um, we tracked it down and they were surprised when they tested the stability of our product. They had to do um, tests to see how it uh, reacted to heat or how it kept basically just testing the preservative qualities. And, yeah, the eugenol really held up well um so yeah that was exciting because it's not only going to be you know supporting the preservation of our product but yeah had its own benefits and the other thing was i think it was slightly anti-estrogenic which was interesting because it's often grouped in the essential oil category um you can get eugenol as an essential oil as such and essential oils are not something i'm a big fan of 
applying directly neat to the skin, most of them, because a lot of them can have slight estrogenic qualities. But, yeah, it was more um, progestogenic, like something anti-estrogen, which was quite interesting. And estrogen at the skin level is very ageing and accelerates cortisol and the effects of cortisol on the skin. So, yeah, that was exciting to find and to see it really working for us as well. Um, and it does give, I don't know if you noticed with the face cream, but it has this very, I think it smells a bit like Christmas. It's got this slightly clothey kind of smell to it. And it's not a, a fragrance as such that we added. It was just what Eugenol brings to it. It gives that slight, yeah. That's yeah, to, to me, it kind of reminded me of like candy, like an orange candy. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. I wanted to eat it. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a really interesting find. And I think since then I've noticed some some products out there that it, you know, you start seeing eugenol popping up as um using it for the preservative effects. So may, maybe it might make a resurgence again. But yeah, it's just I don't know, I think to me people maybe give up too quickly, they look for the these the easiest way of doing things or when it comes to skincare products kind of going oh well that's just what is done in the industry we just need to use these particular stabilizers or preservatives but i don't know look dig back into history a little bit um kind of pre the industrial revolution perhaps and what what was used for eons um and maybe they don't come with the downside that these more convenient products do yeah yeah i recently learned uh, stevia as a preservative if you just put like oh, yeah. 0.1% or something. So I, I was very against it for years. I'm like, just use sugar. But I mean, as for that, it's better probably than other preservatives. Yeah, exactly. And, and we're, we're, you know, your body's eating up some of, a lot of this stuff that we're, they're rubbing in our skin. So you have to be just as discerning, I think, with these ingredients as you would with the ingredients, you know, in your food. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about essential oils. Uh, I think it was like three years ago, I was in my sauna. It's like, I'm going to rub oregano oil on the bottom of my feet and all my pores were open. And I only did that once because within like minutes, I felt the oregano almost like in my eyeballs. It was really uncomfortable. Like it just went wow. systemic and just was circulating. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, you probably, you want to use them correctly, use them minuscule amounts and diluted perhaps, but yeah, yeah, they can be intense. Mm -hmm. um, let's just do a few more questions here, Emma. Uh, does it reverse uh, skin pigmentation? So I don't know if they're referring to like um, steroid or lipofuscin. Yeah, or melasma or yeah, lipofuscin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, possibly. Um, well, we've got a decent amount of niacinamide in there too, which, yeah, is generally um, a really good plan of attack against pigmentation. But I think the, f the saturation of it in itself is what is really helpful because often lipofuscin is that common or that reaction of poofle with iron or perhaps lack of vitamin E. So bringing in the saturated fats to offset the poofer, the copper to offset the iron, the vitamin E, that combination, you know, along with niacinamide, um, even the caffeine a bit helpful on that level as well. So, yeah, I guess I could say, yes, it does. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Depends on again, you know, how much pigmentation there is, but B addressing the things internally that are gonna support that shift. I've seen people reverse pigmentation just purely by changing their food and, and what supplements they take. But you know, getting those, you know, nutrients on the skin as well as coming in from the inside, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I love the caffeine in there. I'm sure you guys get questioned. Is this gonna give me a, a coffee buzz or Yes, it's compared to a cup of coffee, there's a small amount there, but <laughs> yeah, to get it to get it on the skin, um, yeah, does does lots. Mm -hmm. um, last question here, and about pores, does it? Uh, do your products clog pores? And your thoughts on enlarged pores? Um, yeah, I think with enlarged pores, it's about supporting the general tone i think of the skin um a lady sent us a testimonial recently and she she noted that the pores were decreasing in size um could come back from 
from the caffeine a little bit, but at the same time, she's been going heavy on the, the marine collagen and the liver as well. So who knows which had, had more effects, but she also noted that she's, she used to do regular, you know, quite foaming cleanses as well as exfoliants and had stopped all those and really pulled back and was taking more minimalist approach. So maybe the pores were also being exacerbated by being too aggressive with, you know, how you, what you throw at the skin and what you try and strip away from it. So there is that. But um, oh, on clogged pores, the um, the camphor in particular is really interesting. I don't know if you've read much into camphor, but we've got some of that in the face cream as well. But that's shown to be, so you've got products which are comedogenic, which mean they're prone to clogging pores, but camphor is, known to be anti-comedogenic, which is really interesting. So it discourages accumulation in pores and helps keep pores clear, so quite the opposite, which is why we put that in our oil cleanser. We've only got saturated fats, camphor, and vitamin E in the oil cleanser. So a little bit of that just to help or discourage, I suppose, you know, impacting pores with too much junk. Hmm, that's awesome. Um... Well, awesome, Emma. This was really fun. Uh, I took notes and, and learned a little bit. And I'm more inspired to uh, to be consistent, especially the face cream. That one's really easy to use just before I go to bed, put that on or after a shower. Yeah, cool. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Hearing that you like it, Matt, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the little... Uh, the little key is unique. I've never seen that. Like for, uh, I think oh, for the yeah, that's lip balm. Um, when you... Yeah, when your tube starts to empty your, your, your body cream and you want to just get mm. all the stuff out. I, I remember having toothpaste tubes back in the 80s that were more, you know, metal-based and you'd get the back of a comb or something and try and, you know, get every drop out of it. But the tube's kind of handy. You just twist it along and, yeah, get full use of your product. It's okay, so that's, the, so that's designed for the body cream, not the lip balm. Body cream. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, you could probably be big for the lip balm but yeah body cream because it, it's yeah this can be hard to really squeeze everything out so just yeah make sure you completely empty that tube awesome well yeah i recommend you guys go and check out all of their saturated products i love them all they have an awesome liver product and oyster and um oh i didn't notice you guys have marine collagen now i have to try that yeah we sort of brought that out without much lead up it just <laughs> was something we suddenly got hold of. Um, but, yeah, we could see the benefit in having both the bovine collagen, which is more beef pie-derived, as well as a marine one. Um, and the marine one has, it seems to have more specific, uh, quicker results, I suppose, at the skin level. So I use the, the bovine in coffee and things. It's, it's really very neutral in flavour and, the marine one, I just sort of down a tablespoon as a, a shot a day. But, yeah, really good feedback on that too. But the tricky thing was the products we initially looked at, they're sold as being Norwegian or Icelandic or this or that. And then you dig further and look at the fine print and they might have 5 to 10% from Norway, 95% from all over the world, mm. China, Korea, like just a mishmash of, yeah, God knows what quality. Um, so we found one that's 100% straight off the waters between Norway and Iceland and it's wow. super, super clean and processed right there on the spot. Um, yeah, so we managed to hunt that down and, so yeah, it's coming back with a bit of the feedback and dissolves pretty well. It's not, not very fishy or anything. So, Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah, my body thrives on the, the uh, cod liver oil from Norway and uh, I think it's... Yeah, good salt. Yeah, like the the codfish is so. It seems like a heal all. Everything about that fish, it's just super Definitely. beneficial. <laughs> yeah, and it's got to be. Um, this is another thing I learned. You want it codfish skin derived only for the collagen, not mm. all the other bits. And this is purely codfish skin. But mm. yeah, exactly. And and you know that uh, I'm sure like all the seeds are not what they used to be in terms of cleanliness. But you know uh, the oceans up there seem to be less impacted and as clean as you're going to get, I guess. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I'll put the links below where you guys can check out uh, Kitty and Emma's products. Um, both the skincare and the supplements are at saturi.com.au. And you guys ship worldwide, right? Yeah, yeah okay. we do. We've got managed to get really good shipping rates and we've got options for quicker shipping. We'll just have to get a warehouse in the States one day and <laughs> get it on easy there. But yeah, no, so far so good. Last year was a bit tricky with shipping, the more complications, but things seem to be moving much more easily now. How are you going with getting things around I the think, world? I think it's been better. Yeah, for there were several months there where Kitty was messaging me once a month, you know, hey, any shipping updates to Australia? Because <laughs> it was just so yes. bad from what's <laughs> yeah. But I think that loosened up and it's better. And yeah, I think the cost was just insane. Like the shipping cost was like the same as the order cost for the customer. So it yeah. just didn't make sense. Yeah. But I think that's loosened up and it's gotten better. And um, we're, we're a bit of a tiny market down here compared to <laughs> what you've got over there. But you no, know, you've still got a lot of a lot of fans over here who, yeah, it's worth worth getting us down under yeah well I, yeah i appreciate the support and i'll i love supporting you guys and love what you're doing so um thanks emma thanks a lot this was great thanks, uh, thank you that's all for today's show i'm still fascinated by what emma said that cleopatra used lanolin and i just took a milk bath today because i'm swimming in excess goat milk from my dough that's producing about a gallon a day. I really think that high quality dairy, especially goat products, if someone doesn't do well on bovine sources of milk, plus gelatin or bone broth and putting high quality collagen in your smoothies or coffee, I think a combination of all those things alone will do wonders for your skin. But if you're still having issues or you want faster results, stacking it with Emma and Kitty's Saturi skincare products can be really helpful. As I said before, as a guy, I'll probably be using their lip balm product the most. But I loved what Emma said, how it could be used as a first aid with scrapes and scratches because I'm definitely going to get those living out where I do just grazing my hand on things or bumping things happens all the time when you run a farm slash homestead and tend to animals and the land accidents are just going to happen and so to have a tool like this which I think it's way better than Neosporin, which is probably good to keep around as well. But this would be my go-to first if I get a small injury. So if you're interested in checking out their products, their website is Saturi. That's with two E's. So S-A-T-U-R-E-E dot com dot A-U. And if you use the discount code Blackburn, you save a little bit. And I highly recommend all of their products, everything that they produce is awesome and if you want to support me you can go to matt-blackburn.com i have my recommended products up there shout out to blue shield i just picked up their new phi series devices i got their portable unit and their triangular shaped home unit and i don't know if it was coincidence but i plugged that in on my birthday and was really not expecting much because I have a pretty powerful Blue Shield unit that's been running here for the last few years. But both my girlfriend and I experienced, uh, we'll say, intestinal distress. And we were taking probiotics, uh, Mitolife spore-based probiotics, and all the usual stuff, homemade gummies, bone broth, all the supportive things and we had gut disruption for several days and all we could attribute it to was the blue shield and so i actually unplugged it and i don't know if it's because i had both plugged in at the same time 
the Phi series and the cube. So I actually move the Phi series to my goats so they can get the benefits. They're kind of on the other side of the property, but really fascinating. A lot of people say that these devices are just placebo, but I've heard too many stories of people plugging them in and their family or their roommates not knowing and experiencing some kind of detox effect. So they're obviously doing something. And I like the education that Brandon Amalani, he's the U.S. distributor that he provides on the Blue Shield hyphen U.S. website because they're not blocking EMFs. That's not the goal. It's just providing a harmonious signal that the body can recognize. And I don't leave the house without this in my pocket. If I'm staying somewhere, I plug in a home unit. It's become a big part of my EMF mitigation strategy. And it just feels very calming and grounding. Now that I live outside of a big city, and I have for a couple of years now, it's really rough for me going into a population dense area. I just feel more constricted, more tense, and using tools like this and EMF blocking clothing and other things, however much I feel like stacking at the time, really helps to take away that tenseness. So really believe in the Blue Shield products. I've been using them for several years now, maybe five years. And my discount code is Blackburn if you want to try those out. And if you're confused about where to start, I would just say get what you can afford. The plug-in units are a great place to start. And ideally, you would get a home unit and one of the portable units to take with you. I personally use the T1 portable at this time. I haven't experimented or had time yet to leave the house and try the new Phi series portable, but I'm curious to see if I feel a difference with them. And my brand is Mitolife. You can find those products over at mitolife.co and still working hard to get some new products released. Uh, exciting news this week. The Panacea product should be back in stock as of this posting. And if it's out of stock already, then it will be back in stock in a few days so we finally got more tablets over from russia and it's very expensive now importing products from there due to world events so i actually had to pay a hefty thirty-five thousand dollars hit a little punishment for importing a evil russian product called shilajit interesting side note if you're looking to absorb more iron from the shilajit, then take it away from milk and coffee. But if you're looking to block the iron because you don't want any more, maybe you have hereditary hemochromatosis or you measured and confirmed iron overload, which is real, just like iron deficiency is real, then take your panacea tablets with coffee, with your espresso, or with your milk. And either way, it's not a big deal, depending on what your strategy is. I personally take Shilajit mostly for the nootropic effect and for all of the trace minerals in there and the awesome effects of the fulvic acid content. So be sure to check out Mito Life Academy on YouTube. I put up two private videos every month and a live Q&A the last day of every month. And I'm moving fast with research and experimentation and pushing the boundaries, especially lately, the last three or four months, and really just questioning my own beliefs. So if you've been following me for the last few years and I've seemed to be switching it up, then you can check out the Mito Life Academy. I often post 20, 30, 40 minute videos of my current thoughts on things, whether it's iron deficiency or zinc or cod liver oil or whatever it is. So that's a lot of fun for me. 
And I really appreciate people sending in their testimonials and being with me on this journey and realizing that no one health educator has all the answers. Some will convince you of that. They'll give the, you the illusion of that with their elaborate protocol or courses or people that they've trained or books they've written, whatever it is, it's really important to vet people's information and look into who they're getting information from. I think we often don't do that. And I'm guilty of this just because it's so time consuming. At some point, we have to take someone's word for it unless you're like me and it's your life. It's all you do is research and share. Then I have time to delve into material by Robert Crichton and actually look at what he says about iron overload and look at what he says about ferritin being the ideal lab marker, the accurate lab marker to diagnose iron deficiency. So anyway, that's Mitolife Academy on YouTube. It's 15 bucks a month. If you sign up, you gain access to the previous couple years of content, which is hundreds of hours at this point. So thank you guys for listening. Thanks for sharing this podcast with your friends. Happy to announce we just hit 1.6 million downloads. So that's really exciting. And it's really cool to be someone in the quote limelight that's being transparent with evolving and admitting that they're wrong. That's very rare to see nowadays. And so I appreciate those of you that recognize that and support that because I never want to stop evolving. See you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged.